Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Carl Garcia and I'm the campus pastor at our Clear Lake campus. Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we're so glad that you joined us to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe that life is better when we do it together. When we gather as a church, it's a non-downloadable experience. Singing together, praying together, serving together, those are all things that just don't translate online but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you, make plans to check out the campus nearest you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us at clearcreek.org to find out information about our locations, our service times, and so much more. We hope to see you soon. All right, everybody, let me, let me do this. Let me start off with, uh, I know it's the Christmas season, so let me just do a quick show of hands. I'm going to mention some movies, Christmas movies, and you guys tell me by a show of hands if this is like top three. Top three. So let me just, let me, let me go uh, uh, through a few of these. Uh, Miracle on 34th Street. Anyone that's in your top three? Okay. Um, Elf. Top three. All right. Cool. Uh, Christmas Story. All right. That's a good one. Uh, someone got mad at me because I didn't mention this last time. I said, don't ever come back. Uh, Home Alone. I've never seen that show, honestly. I've never seen it. You filthy animals. Uh, I actually haven't seen it. I've just seen clips. YouTube did the rest of it for me. Um, it's a Wonderful Life. Uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. That's the best one, just so you know. Uh, let's see, what else? Die Hard. It's a Christmas movie. All right, so that's a pretty good survey. Let me do this. I'm going to give you one. Uh, I don't know if this is my top three. It's my mom. She had her 85th birthday yesterday. It's her favorite movie Christmas movie of all time, and so whenever it's on television, she watches it. Usually, it's on the religious channel because it's a religious. This is a Christian show. It's called National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. <laughs> yeah, that was a little bit of a stretch on that last part. Anyone would put that in your top three? All right. So like, it's like again, that's my it's my mom's. Now, if you if you don't know anything about this, uh, I don't know where you've been, but let me just tell you the storyline. So Chevy Chase, as you see there, plays Clark Griswold, <clears throat> kind of this. A little dim-witted somewhat, but, but kind of a, a really fun-loving personality. And what he's been doing this whole time, the whole movie's a build-up. Like, he's got this incredible expectation. He's giddy with excitement because he's going to get this, basically, his bonus check at the end of the year for his uh, Christmas bonus. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to get a pool. That's what he wants to do is build a pool for his family. But kind of the, the climax of it, at least at the, maybe the nadir, the, the, the bottom point of this is when he, he gets his envelope that he knows that's going to be the check for his bonus check. Because he's already like put a down payment on this, on this pool. He's hoping this check's going to float and this thing's going to keep him afloat. But when he opens it up, as you can see here in the scene, <clears throat> it's not the check. It's not a check. So those of you who have seen this movie, you can help us out. So he gets a membership to what? Jelly of the Month Club. Now, as you can tell there by Chevy Chase's face, that this is not what he expected. And then everyone's just in shock because he's like, oh, my gosh, the disappointment. And this is then Cousin Eddie, the back left, <laughs> one of the great characters of any Christmas show. He says, that's okay, Clark. That's just the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> I mean, just like a horrible, horrible response. And so from this point on in the movie, uh, Clark Griswold is unsatisfied. He's unsettled. He's disappointed. He's darn near uh, seriously like going to hopelessness and despair. And then the movie all goes haywire. I'll let you watch it out. Uh, and so here, here's what I think is funny about that. I, I know we laugh at all that stuff, but to be honest with you, I mean, we can't give Clark Griswold too hard of a time because everyone is on a journey towards some kind of satisfaction. They're moving towards some kind of joy, some kind of, some kind of peace, some, some kind of hope. And he's, he's no different. The, the challenge in our world is that there are all these kind of competing voices, especially in suburbia, that tell you where your ultimate satisfaction should lie. Like This is where ultimate joy and peace and hope is found. And some, and especially in our neck of the woods, a lot of people hear the voice or the message that it's marriage. If you just get married, that's going to 
that's going to be the thing that, that gives you ultimate worth. Or no, they'll say it's not marriage, it's actually a family. So if you get married and have kids, then that's going to have, like you have X amount of kids, that's going to, that's going to make you happy. And others would say, no, it's neither of those things. In, in this world, you get, you really just, it's your job that gives you your identity, that gives you your purpose. That's what's ultimately going to satisfy you. And then there's another voice that says, none of those are. It's really just money. If you have enough money, if your income's X amount of dollars, if, if, if it's, everything's up and to the right and you have you know, X amount of cash, that's what's going to give you joy and peace. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but there, we, not everyone's 22 here in this room. Uh, those people that are probably more towards my age, I'm 52 and on up, after you live a, bit, a, little, uh, a little bit of life, you start to realize, well, those things are, can be really good things. I mean, just think about that. An occupation, marriage, a, a family, money, like those aren't in and of themselves bad. But over time, as you get older, the, the, things start to turn. I mean, uh, you ever heard of the term midlife crisis? Well, the reason it, it comes like that is because all of those messages don't really come true. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't a degree of satisfaction with all those, but it's like, uh, like completely satisfied, like my ultimate joy and hope in those things. And what happens is, is people, when they start to realize, well, man, not all of those things are, I mean, those are, those are good things, and sometimes those are great things, but giving me my ultimate satisfaction, why do I feel so unsettled? And unsatisfied. And then all of a sudden, everyone starts doing new things, right? Some people start taking up new practices. You know, Bruce over there doing, uh, Bruce Wesley doing fly fishing. Uh, I, uh, some people doing paint. I, I do, like, I, I started distilling whiskey. That's what I did. I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, kind of. Uh, it's a sill in the back of my house. No, I mean, like, so you start doing stuff like that. And then all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, that's fun. But that still doesn't, that doesn't fill up the whole deal. And then it's like, well, it's other people like, well, I just need a new start. And so this is a little more sobering, though. Like, I'll just do a new, I'll just do a new family. I'll get a new spouse. I'll, I'll get a new uh, marriage. I'll get a new job. I'll just do something new because that, surely that's going to kick back up some hope in my heart and in my life. And other people are like, well, it's not a new practice or a new start. They just do a new project. It's, it's renovating their house for the 40th time. It's like, well, we just did the, the kitchen. Let's, let, no, let's do the master bedroom. Let's do this. And those aren't bad things. I don't want you to hear me. I, I think those are bad. But, like, the, the reason you're doing them is not because your house needs it. Like you're just trying to have a spark of hope or some kind of joy in your day. And other people say, no, I'm gonna, my new project is not going to renovate the house. I'm going to renovate me. I'm going I'm to hit the gym because that's going to be the thing that gets me satisfaction. And other people, you're going to Clark Griswold it. You're going to be like, no, it's a pool. If we just got a pool as a family, everything would be fine. And the truth is, again, I want you to hear me. I, I, those, are, those are fine things, but you might over time, over time, over time, over time, you might find yourself like Clark where you got this feeling like, yeah, those are cool and all, but they ultimately feel like jellies of the month. I mean, they're nice, and they have a purpose for them, but they don't, they're not like sustaining. Like, i got, I got to find something new. And if that's like even remotely how you've ever felt, if you've ever felt some sense of dissatisfaction or some unsettled part of your heart and your soul, then you've come to the right place. We're in a series, as Chris alluded to, talking about a people of hope, where we're talking about what, what does it look like to be a, a people that have hope beating strongly in us because of our relationship to Jesus. And so here's what I want to do today. I want to take you to one passage, actually one verse. I just want to take you to one verse. So if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to take, uh, go with me and turn with me to Romans chapter, I had to think about, what am I teaching on today? Romans chapter 15. We're going to look at verse 13. <clears throat> so if you have, uh, have a Bible, it's in the New Testament. So you have all these books of the Old Testament, these books about Israel and the original covenant people of God. And you have the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, all the way to Revelation. So if you've never understood where a Bible, how that works, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. That's where we are. So if you have a on your app, just dial it up, Romans chapter 15. That's toward the back of the book. We're going to look at verse 13. Now let me give you a little context here. This is a letter written by Paul the Apostle to the church at Rome predominantly Gentile church, Gentile meaning non-Jewish church, so non-Jewish Christian, I should say. So for the better part of 15 chapters, he's been arguing and trying to show his Jewish countrymen that have come to faith in Jesus that also these Gentiles have come to faith in Jesus, and we're all in one big happy family, the church, God's new covenant people, uh, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. That's all he's been trying to do. In fact, the very, the, the very verse prior to 1513, obviously 1512, says this. It says, uh, in him, he's quoting uh, Isaiah, actually. It says, in him, or in Jesus, will the Gentiles hope. So he's like, Jesus isn't just the hope for the Jews, isn't just the hope of Israel. He's the hope of the world. He's the hope of the Gentiles. And when he says hope, all of a sudden, it just, it just 
I don't want to say it triggers them. It just kind of gets them on, a, on this kind of mini rant for one verse talking about hope. Hey, since I'm talking about hope, let me, let me bless you guys and offer a benediction about hope. And he says this most amazing verse. It's just this one little line that I want to break down to show you um, maybe why you and I should have and can have a little more hope in our lives. So let's look at what he says, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Now it's a very simple verse. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. That's what he says to them. He just gets you talking about hope. He says, oh, by the way, speaking of hope, boom. And notice what he does. Let's just kind of work through this. Notice how he refers to God in the very first part of this verse. He says, may the God of hope. The God of hope. Now think about that. He could have talked about God with any kind of title. He could have said, may the God of the universe, the God of creation, or the God of Israel, the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, the God of the covenant. I mean, any kind of title that we already see in Scripture. And usually, that's what these guys, these apostles would do. They would just, they wouldn't create a title. They would just use a title that's already out there. And that's not what Paul does in this text at all. He says, no, 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 I'm talking about the God of hope. It's as if for Paul, God is not only the origin of hope, he's the object of hope. In other words, that if you're you're running low on hope, the first place you ought to turn to is God. Now that's that's good to know, because in our culture, there's there's this temptation to, and we've already addressed it, to run to all these other different avenues, these other different objects, these other different options, uh, marriage or family or work or money or hobby or whatever it is. And the challenge is that those options, as good as they are in and of themselves, they have this limitation. They have this limited capacity and capability to satisfy our soul's desire for satisfaction, our soul's desire for hope, our soul's desire for joy and peace. Uh, you got a soulish desire for that, and you may not know that, but like subconsciously, like if I, could, if I could pop the hood on your heart, your heart has a desire to have a deep satisfaction for it. Now here's what I, the, the reason I say it's so challenging in our world today is, is because of this. Imagine, it's going to be kind of a, uh, I don't think it's crude, but it's maybe a little too simplistic, but just go with me. Imagine in each one of us, we have a hope tank, and that hope tank's 20 gallons, right? But everything that we see in our life doesn't have 20 gallons of hope in it. Some of it has three gallons of hope. Some of it has five gallons of hope. And let's just say the very best thing that we can find out there, the things that bring us the most hope on an earthly perspective, have 10 gallons of hope. So here's what often happens. Uh, Why people tend to struggle is what they'll do is this. They'll be like, okay, I need more hope in my life, so I need to, I need to go get hitched or get rehitched. I need to, I need to really pour my life into my family because I'm not, I'm not getting enough out of it. I need to pour more of my life into my job. Like Whatever it is, that they're going to invest in that in such a way where they're hoping the return is, all right, so job's going to pour more hope into my heart. My, my hope tank, I should say. Uh, my, my, my spouse is going to fill me up in my hope tank. And what happens is even the best of those options is only going to fill it up to, let's just say, 10 gallons of a 20-gallon hope tank, right? And, and, and what, what happens with that is this. It's, it's not in the initial filling up that we have a problem. So, like, it's that spouse, it's that marriage, it's that job, it's that money, whatever. It's that new boat, it's that pool, Initially, all you're feeling is the pouring in of hope in the hope tank. And so it's like, oh, it's one gallon now, it's two gallons now. Oh, I'm getting some joy and I'm getting some satisfaction and I'm getting a little bit of hope. But, but when it runs out, what you feel is the gap. You don't feel like how much it gave you in the time. Now that time's over. You all know how that goes. You all celebrate Christmas, don't you? You get all these things you want for Christmas, but, but you don't want those same things for the next year Christmas because they're already done. How many of you were kids? Anyone raise a hand when you, if you ever were a kid? All right. <laughs> Remember like all the things that you just had to have, begging mommy and daddy, crying that Santa would bring it, and Santa brought it, and like, oh, like three weeks later, like, well, I don't, what? I'm ready for something. You're scratching out your list for the next year already? That never changes, y'all, because none of those have the capacity to fill us up. That's just, that's just how that is. They're not, they're not supposed to do that. And what happens is this, and this is, this is a lot more sober, right? So when you're an adult, kids, when you're an adult, and that's, you still have those same kind of patterns and practices where you're expecting all these things that you're kind of running after to fill up your hope tank, when they don't, because they can't, uh, that gap in there, that's where it starts to burn you a little bit. That's that's where you start to get sideways. And some people, like, they get bored, and all of a sudden they got to try something new because they can't live with boredom. Uh, Other people, um, 
they took too much pressure on those objects, and so all of a sudden they start to turn up the heat. Like, think about relationships. They're like, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm demanding more of you than you can humanly give back to me. But they don't know that. Like, I'm just, you should give me more satisfaction in my life, right? So, so why don't you? Because they don't. They feel that gap in their heart. All of a sudden, their spouse, their loved one starts to feel the pressure. Right? Everything that used to be like a three problem is now a five problem. Everything is a five problem is now a nine problem. Like, what's going on? It's because there's something deeper than the problem on the surface. There's a deeper problem, which is saying this person's like, I feel this 10-gallon gap, and I need you to fill it. And all of a sudden, if it continues like that, then you move to cynicism, you move to anger, and at worst, you even move to apathy. And that's the kind of problems that can happen when you expect essentially this. You're expecting a 20-gallon response from a 10-gallon resource. I want you to hear this. 10-gallon resources are really good. And 5-gallon resources are really good. And 1-gallon resources are really good as it pertains to filling us up with hope, right? But if you're expecting a 10-gallon response from a, excuse me, a 20-gallon response, because that's how we're built, but you're only looking at things that can give you at the most 10 gallons, that gap in there, what happens is you'll use that as a burn against those folks. I mean, if I could just be very serious about this all of a sudden, not that I haven't been, but just a little more sober, some of you, and just some of you, some of you are suffering in your marriages and in your relationships because you're demanding something from your spouse they don't have the capacity to give you, and they're not supposed to be giving it to you. And it's killing you. And, and you're wondering, well, I should get more satisfaction from you. But maybe, just maybe, just maybe, they're like really freaking good at being a spouse. But they're really bad at being a God. And the problem is that that gap, you just feel like they ought to meet it. And so they just, it's just a no-win situation. It's a no-win for you, and it's a no-win from them, right? You're putting too much pressure on them. And what happens is this. All of a sudden now, it, it's going to... Even your marriage, even your family, even the things you love the most all start to not like them as much because they start to turn into jellies of the month. Stuff that you're like disappointed in and unsatisfied in and uh, affected by. All because of this kind of expectation. Now listen, you never heard someone say, this is, well, maybe you have, I haven't. This is my spouse of hope. This is my family of hope. This is my job of hope. This is my money of hope. I've never heard that, right? I've heard great things about families and spouses and jobs. And this is my hobby. of I've never heard this. And yet Paul says to us today, I tell you this, there is a God of hope. That's his game. That's his business. That's what he does. In fact, how do we know this? Well, watch what it says. May the God of hope, let's go to the next part of that phrase. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Now notice, notice the, you know, I don't want to grammar police here, but this is a big deal. Notice the adjectives there. It's not just that God of the hope, that the, our God of hope fills us with joy and peace. Notice what it says. How much of that? A little bit, a gallon, a two gallon? What's it say? All. May the God of hope fill you with all peace. What that means is, is that there's no tank big enough that God in his mercy can't fill your heart up with hope. So like you got a 20 gallon tank or a thousand gallon tank. God in his mercy can fill you up, let's just get again, fill you with all joy and peace. And when you have joy and peace, that's where hope comes from, right? He's never gonna, God's never coming up short. He's never going to disappoint. He's never going to leave our, our hearts lacking. Because remember, God is the God of hope. Hope's his business. Now listen, let me tell you why that's true. Why would God be this person that has this, this endless supply of joy and peace, like all? Well, there's a lot of things, because he's... He's got all these resources in himself. I mean, just break them down a little bit. I mean, God's the creator. I mean, that's pretty good. He spoke the universe into existence. I, do you know anyone who did that? God did it. So what kind of resources does a guy have to have to just speak it into existence? That's, that's pretty powerful. Not only that, God is shaping history and moving history towards his own ends. We've been studying for the last two or three weeks, like the return of Jesus, because we've been studying the, the, the letters to, uh, from Peter. God is moving history towards the end when Christ returns. Now, that, that's a pretty darn good resource. In fact, speaking of Jesus, I mean, how do we know God is the God who has this endless supply of joy and hope? How do we know he's got the resources to do that? How, how did we know that he can fill 20 gallons worth of emptiness in us for hope? It's because ultimately he gives us Jesus. He sends his very own son, himself in the person of, uh, of, of Jesus, to live this perfect life that we were supposed to live and to die on a cross in our place and to suffer the penalty of our sins 
so that he would take that penalty and give us his righteousness in return for those who believe in him. And Jesus rises from the dead to show like everything I talked about, I I told you I would do it. That's what I'm going to do. And not just that, I'm going to return one day and bring the fullness of the kingdom that I've already shown you a glimpse of. Like that, that's the kind of God that we're dealing with. So no wonder he can quench any hope thirsty heart. And so here's what I love about this. So not only does he do it all, but notice what he fills us up with. Now, joy and peace. Now, here's what I don't want you to get confused on. A lot of people read joy and peace and thinking, ah, man, I mean, we already have kind of joy and peace. But the joy and peace that the Bible talks about more often than not, and for sure what Paul's talking about here in Romans 15, is that this is not a joy and peace connected to your circumstances. That's what you need to get. So, So look at the word joy there. Joy is essentially an inward satisfaction of the soul. And peace is essentially an inward settledness of your soul. Did you hear what I said? I said soul. So joy, I'll say it again, is an inward satisfaction of the soul. And peace is an inward serenity of the soul. And the reason I, I'm saying of the soul and being so careful about that is because what's important to understand is when, when God says that he's going to give us joy and peace... He's not connecting that to our circumstances. That's how the world works. Oh, Yancey, if my life is some kind of like graph, when things are up and well, I have joy and peace. When things are down and low, right? You know, I go through a divorce, there's a death in the family, someone got cancer, you know, something bad. But I don't have much joy and peace. It's because your joy and peace are connected to the things that go on around you. And I'm not saying that's weird or abnormal. That's normally how that works. But the gift that God gives is like, I can give you a joy and peace soulish-wise. I can, I can give you a joy and a peace that's not connected to your circumstances. In other words, I can kind of give you a, a settledness and a serenity of your soul and a satisfaction of that soul that is regardless of what's going on around you. And in fact, uh, your world can be going to the crapper. That's the theological term. I have Cousin Eddie in my head, but I'm not going to say what he said. <laughs> Y'all know. Uh, Forgive the language here. Let me just be blunt. Your world can be going to the crapper. And yet you won't be. Like everything can be falling apart. Your kids can be blowing up. Your marriage can suffer. Uh, Your health can be in question. I mean, things just, it seems like the deck of cards is not falling in the right places this time in the chapters in your life. And you can still have joy and peace because those things at the soulless level aren't connected to your circumstances. Now, would you want to have better circumstances? Of course you would. I want my marriage up in the right. I want all my kids doing the right. I, I, yes, we want that. But you can still have a deep abiding joy and peace in spite of your circumstances. Here's why. Because the joy and peace that God's providing isn't connected to your circumstances. It's connected to him. Let, let me give you an example. <clears throat> so it's connected to him in the gospel, in the person of Jesus. So I, one of the reasons I, I try to tap into joy that's not circumstantial but in, centered in Christ is just I remind myself quite often that I am loved and accepted in Jesus. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you are loved and accepted by God. That God's not looking for a better version of you to love. That you cannot out God's love and grace for you if you're in Christ because you are in Christ. That God sees you as he sees his son. And so that's very important. Do you know how, how many people are starving to be loved and accepted? How many people make really bad decisions because they're looking for love and acceptance from junior high on up? Like, that still sticks with you. But, if, but, but to know that I'm completely and utterly loved by a holy God gives me a sense of joy that transcends my sin. And I, just so you guys know, I've had, a, I've had some pretty tough chapters in my life. And yet I've had a deep joy, like I'm leaning in and using the joy of the Lord as a hammock to rest in because it's tied to who what Jesus has done for me. Same thing with peace. I have this deep peace in my life, and sometimes I wish I had it more than other times, but I, I generally have a deep peace in my life because, for example, we've been talking about God coming back in the person of Jesus in the second coming. Like, that means something to me. When I see everything falling apart around me, I realize, you know what God's going to do at the end of the age? He's putting all the pieces together, and he's going to smooth out all the sin problems. He's going to make all things new. So as, however bad it gets, I can have peace knowing God's in control. He's in control. So actually, in spite of what I see around me, it shouldn't overwhelm me to such a degree where I'm hopeless or joyless or have a lack of peace. In fact, I can have a great deep sense of all of those things because my joy and my peace aren't being filled up by the circumstances of the world or the objects I'm running after. It's been filled up by God himself in the person of Jesus. 
It's just, it's just a huge, 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 huge change. So, um, so huge at this. In fact, how does this come about? Because you're like, Yancey, I, dude, I want to dig in on that. And I, I'd like to say I do this perfectly. I don't. But, man, I, I feel a deep sense of God's joy and God's peace. How does that happen? Just continue to read the verse. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace. How? Notice what it says next. Say it with me. In believing. Now, oh, hold on now. Yo, this is big, y'all. In believing. Now, notice, even in the English, not just the original language of Greek, but even in the English we can see, it's not just in belief or when you believed. Notice this is something that started in the past and it's continuing in the present. In believing, this is what happens. In believing, we get to experience God's joy and peace filled up tank 20, you know, all 20 gallons. How? In, in, in believing. Now, notice again, uh, let me tell you why this is important, y'all. A lot of people treat God, and I'm not saying you do, I'm just saying in general, and maybe, maybe it's you. A lot of people treat God like he's the divine attendant at the gas station. And his job is, he's got the hope tank, and his job is to fill you up. So here's what happens. People are like, they, they essentially just live their own life. They're not really trying to follow Jesus. And it's not that they don't like Jesus. They maybe even love Jesus, but they're kind of doing their own thing. But their circumstances kind of get messed up, and they feel a lack of joy or a lack of peace, a lack of hope. <clears throat> And so they'll say, you know what, I need to start going back to church. I'm just going to go to a service. So they come to a service, and they hear someone like me, and they sing these songs. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, I feel better today. You know, I, got, I, I feel better today. And then they go off and kind of do the same things that they were doing before they ever walked in, and they get back in the same spot. But, but how they kind of relate to God is this. I'll just, go to, I'll, just drive up to the, I'll just drive up to God's gas station and, and, and through like a service or songs or whatever, I'm just I'm going to get a little bit just to fill me up, not even 20, just, just to fill me up a little bit, and then I'm going to go off and kind of run away and, and do my, my thing. But that's not what this is saying here at all. In fact, um, that, that's, that's not what this passage is teaching. I'll say it again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, like in current belief. Let me go back to the illustration. Um, Far from God being the attendant at the gas station, where all you're trying to do is just get a little bit of what he's got, what, what, makes, what makes the hope and joy and peace that God gives such a good thing, such a, a lasting thing, such a filling thing, it's not because God's dispensing it from somewhere else. The real gift that God gives is himself in a relationship. In other words, like you're not going to the gas station to get gas from him. You're actually going to the gas station to just go see the attendant to see the owner, to, sp to spend time with him. See, here it says in believing. I think the Greek word here is pistis, which just means faith. So it's like in faith. Like I'm, 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 I'm wanting by faith to come back to God and to seek God and to know God and to deepen myself in God so that I will experience the work of his spirit in me so I my joy tank, excuse me, my hope tank's filled with love, excuse me, with joy and peace. So I actually am more hopeful than I've ever been. But that only comes because I'm trying to pursue Jesus not because I'm trying to pursue the stuff he gives me. See, there's a big difference. See, some people want God for the stuff he gives, and then some people want God because he's God. And God's not seeking to just give stuff to people to give to him, because ultimately, the ultimate prize isn't the things he gives. The ultimate prize is himself. It's God. So, so when we look at this text, uh, and I, I kind of think through this, uh, some people ask me, all right, Yancey, so how do I have that kind of hope? How do I have the kind of hope in my life that's filled up to the 20 gallons? How do I have the kind of love and peace, excuse me, the joy and peace in my heart where I feel super hopeful, ir irrespective, regardless of my circumstances? And here's what I tell people. It's not a secret, man. It's not a secret. The, the deal is you've got to learn how to grow deeply in who Jesus is. You've got to learn how to grow deep in the gospel. In other words, you've got you've to make your spiritual formation like a priority in your life. You can't dip into the gas station once a month and go, well, that's all I need. No, no, like you, you need to fall in love with the God that runs the place. You need to deepen yourself in the grace that he has and the kingdom that he talks about and the glory that he's bringing with him. Like you, you need to be a part of that community and deepen yourself, just not just biblically, but theologically and everywhere else because the secret to it all, and I, I hate to use the word secret, but the secret to it all is like, Experiencing this kind of peace isn't a one-time event. It's in the one-time events over events over events, living in community and growing deeply in your godliness. That's why when you do that, you're closer to God in Christ than when you are. Well, guess what you get to experience? 
the work of the Holy Spirit in you. And that's exactly what we see at the end of this passage. I'll conclude it with this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that we do this in faith and we grow in our faith. Why? So that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. (laughs) I love that, man. Love that passage, that you may abound in hope. So what I'm telling you is this. What does in believing mean? Well, it's like one author I read a long time ago. He famously said, in believing is essentially a long obedience in the same direction. Like, I'm just going to commit to be a part of a group, to be a part of a church, to be a part of a community, and I'm going to be consistently trying to grow in Jesus so I can have a bigger expanse and exposure to the grace of God so that when the Holy Spirit works in my life, he's filling me up. And what, notice what's, what, what Paul tells the Romans. It's not just to fill you up, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life, that you may what in hope? Abound. It's okay to speak English here. Abound. Say it with me. So in the Greek, it's actually another way that you can translate it, so that you might overflow with hope. Overflow. I like the language there, because it's going back to my tank stuff. Imagine imagine being a group of people called followers of Jesus, who are so given to Jesus and so uh, growing in Jesus that the Holy Spirit's working in their life to such a degree that they always have uh, 20-gallon hope-filled tanks filling over, spilling over the brim. Imagine what that would do for this area. Imagine in a world that's so desperate for hope, right here, that's so uh, thirsty for something more substantive than what they're running after, whether it's marriage or family or or pools or cars or money. As good as those things are, they're really bad gods. And yet here we have a people at Clear Creek Community Church that are so leaning into Jesus, so trying to follow God, that God in his grace is responding, filling those tanks up with joy and peace, and all of a sudden they're overflowing with hope. That Listen, you don't need to know your whole testimony. You don't need to know the Bible frontwards and backwards. You don't need to go around giving tracts to everybody. You live. You live like heaven in a world that's living like hell. You'll stand out. You live with hope overflowing out of you. I can promise you, you'll stand out. And they'll go, why are you so crazy? Why is it when the world's falling apart, you're not? It's because your hope is not tied to the world. It's tied to the God who's above it all. And when that happens, listen, we're talking about in this series that we talk about the 4B area. This area that we believe God's given us here in the South Bay area of Houston, Southeast Houston. And I'm just telling you this, we will make one heaven of a dent for the kingdom of God if we would just allow ourselves to grow deeply enough to be overwhelmed by the goodness of God so that when things go poorly around us, we don't go poorly. We overflow with hope. That will be a fragrant aroma that is attractive enough to bring people to Jesus in a world starving for it. Amen? So let me tell you what that means for some of us. Um, How do we approach it, Yancey, by faith in believing? Because it only comes by believing. I think, and I've already said, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is just like, especially with January coming around, and for those of you who like to make New Year's resolutions, maybe your resolution is like, listen, I'm going to... I'm going to get more serious about my faith. I'm going to be more consistent. I'm going to, be, I want to dig into a small group. I, need, I want to be a part of a, a growing community so I can deepen myself. I'm going to grow. I mean, I teach 140-something people every Monday for two hours, just lay people, theology. And I mean, we're talking lay people that get there at 6.30 to 8.30. They, they don't miss a beat. You know what? That's how thirsty people are to grow in Jesus. And it, I can promise you those people will be changed for the better, and they'll have a greater hope factor when they leave. Because they're just coming across the goodness of Jesus. We want to do that across the board. Now, others of you, it may be this. You can see, I, I, I mean, someone promised me a free lunch if I'd come with them to church. I don't know anything about Jesus. First of all, that's a good friend. I hope they take you to, like, Lupe Tortillas or somewhere like that. But nevertheless, if, you've not, if you're here and you, you don't know anything about Jesus, here's where I would start. Just start trying to know him. Let us help you. We can get you into a class called Starting Point. We can start with, it's for people that aren't Christians. You can talk with any one of us in the lobby. People would be willing to help you. So like for you, it's like you got to start believing in order to continue to believe. But we want to be that kind of church for you guys. Listen, let me, my, time's, my time's almost up right now. So let me just say this. If you watch the movie, Christmas Vacation, all right, at the end, it all kind of works out for Clark. And ultimately, he's going to get his pool. But at some point, they don't do, uh, at, at some point, my assumption is Clark's like most all of us. That pool's nice, but if you're putting all your hopes in it, it turns into a jelly of the month at some point. It's not that satisfying. It's awesome, not that satisfying. He's going to be running at something else. There was Christmas vacation too, if I remember. So <laughs> here's what I will say this. Um, 
Watch out. Treat the good gifts that you have in life as gifts. Don't treat them as God's. God's here to give you himself so that you might live a life full of hope. Hope despite your circumstances with a joy and a peace that go beyond things that are tied to this world so that you can show some people around you, a lot of people around you, how out of worldly your life is. Not that you're weird or crazy, though you might be those things to people, but that you're so overflowing with hope that people want to know the Jesus you serve. Man, that's how you make a dent in this world. That's how you're a people of hope. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much for the goodness of Jesus. And I want to thank you for my friends in this room that don't know you. Golly, how cool is it that they would just come to listen and learn about you. So Lord, I pray that even by your spirit now, you, you would bring them to a place where like, yep, sign me up. I want to follow Jesus. I want to repent of my sins and turn away from being my own Lord and Savior. I want to embrace this Jesus person who's died for me and rose for me, who's the Son of God. And Lord, for the rest of us here who are followers of your son, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to just lean in all the more, especially as we see 2024 just around the corner, that we would celebrate the birth of Jesus in Christmas but not stop there, that we would say, you know what, yep, I need to deepen myself. I've kind of placed too many of my hope chips in other different places and not enough on him, not enough on you, Lord, I should say. Lord, I pray that we would see the gap in our tank and that maybe for some of us, God, we, we just need to tell our spouse or our kids or our job or whatever. Like, we just need to repent and say, I'm sorry. I've, I've, I've tried to make you more than what you were even designed to do. As great as you are, like, I just apologize. And Lord, I, I, I have a spiritual issue that only God's Spirit can satisfy. So, Lord, wherever we are, I pray that you would do your work in us throughout this message and after this message so that we ultimately would be a people of hope for you and your glory. And pray it in Christ's name. Amen.